Energy in the COP21. My name is uh, Alex Taylor. I'm a European journalist. It's my pleasure to be your uh, host for this uh, debate, uh, especially uh, seeing I recognize quite a few people from other debates uh, that I've hosted on different green issues. We have lots of guests, absolutely. I was going to give you a big welcome on the stage. Uh, please welcome uh, Claude Thiomès, who's a member of the European Parliament. Big round of applause, if you can, for him. Thank you very much. We also have... Uh, from Brazil, Mauricio Tolmaskim, the Chief Executive Officer of the Energy Research uh, Office. Here you are. Bienvenida. Mr. Andas Runavad, who's the CEO of Vestas. Uh, there we are. Thank you very much for being with us. Francesco Venturini, the Chief Executive Officer and General Manager of Enel Green Power. Bonjour. And we're also delighted uh, to have with us uh, Cédric Philibert from the uh, International Energy Agency. There you are. There. Thank you very much indeed. My name is Alex Taylor. I'm a European journalist. Delighted uh, to be with you. Um, as you know, we've had a few changes to our program. Uh, Corinne Lepage, unfortunately, can't be here. She's the president of Citizenship Action Participation for the 21st uh, Century. Uh, party, but she uh, wanted to say a few words uh, to you. She's uh, recorded. Will be in French. So let's have a look first of all and see what uh, Corinne Lepage has to say. Top video. Bonjour. Je regrette infiniment que mon emploi du temps ne m'ait pas permis d'être parmi vous aujourd'hui pour cette belle manifestation à laquelle je souhaite un grand succès, dont je suis assurée qu'il sera au rendez-vous. Ces quelques mots pour vous dire mon entier soutien au développement de la filière éolienne et plus généralement au développement des énergies renouvelables. Je pense que si, avec la COP21 et toutes les informations qui aujourd'hui sont sur la place publique, relative à notre situation climatique sur le plan global. Chacun n'a pas compris l'importance qu'il y a à développer les énergies renouvelables, alors la situation, effectivement, me semble extrêmement périlleuse. Vous développez une industrie qui, aujourd'hui, est totalement mature, euh, qui est concurrentielle, euh, puisque les prix, aujourd'hui, de l'électricité éolienne euh, sont euh, des prix euh, qui ont rejoint les prix du marché. Je sais et je connais les difficultés auxquelles euh, l'énergie éolienne s'est heurtée pour se développer en France avec une hostilité euh, parfois de bonne foi, souvent de très mauvaise foi et totalement organisée euh, par les lobbies eux, qui ont intérêt au, au maintien des, euh, des énergies du passé, en particulier de l'électricité nucléaire. Certes, nous devons respecter nos paysages, euh, et euh, ne pas installer euh, les éoliennes sans prendre en considération les sites dans lesquels ils sont implantés. Mais la guérilla juridique qui a entouré euh, l'installation d'éoliennes et les réglementations absurdes qui se sont amoncelées les unes après les autres ont été euh, des erreurs que nous allons euh, payer euh, pendant un certain nombre d'années. Aujourd'hui, euh, heureusement, euh, les choses se sont un peu améliorées et nous pouvons espérer un développement de l'éolien terrestre qui, avec le solaire, la biomasse, la géothermie, vont devenir les modes de production d'électricité classiques dans les années qui viennent. Et je fais tout à fait partie de ceux qui sont pleinement confiants sur la capacité de la France à être à 100% énergie renouvelable et par conséquent 100% autonome en 2050. Je ne doute pas que les débats que vous allez avoir vont être importants autour des prix désormais qui ne sont plus vraiment les prix de rachat, autour des difficultés que vous pouvez encore rencontrer. Mais je pense que la situation est quand même en voie d'amélioration. En tout cas, vous pouvez compter sur l'appui qui a toujours été le mien pour aider au développement de cette filière qui est une des filières importantes. Euh, de, euh, des énergies renouvelables dans notre pays et à l'extérieur dans les années qui viennent.
a few uh, words uh, to start off our debate. Just a, a word about how um, we've organized this. We have uh, one and a half hours. The first half hour, I will ask you all an introductory question so that you can introduce yourselves and give us your, uh, some idea of uh, uh, where you're coming from. Afterwards, um, a second uh, phase where I'm going to get you to talk amongst uh, yourselves. I have some uh, questions to challenge you. And then for the last half hour, um, please feel free, I will come into the audience and you can make any points or ask uh, questions. Let's start off with you, uh, Claude uh, Tumes from the, uh, the, the European Parliament. Uh, I've hosted quite a few things uh, with you. I know your passion about uh, all, all kinds of uh, renewable energies. But um, tell us, to start off, why is it more rational uh, to invest in solar and wind energy in Germany rather than in Greece? Or well, what's the difference between different countries? Can you start us off by, by giving us a, a, a European perspective? So, uh, I think if we can hear you, it'd be even better. Oh, and just for our translators, uh, interpreters here, could yeah. you, the, the, the acoustics here are rather strange. If you have to put the microphone against yeah, as close the chin. as possible. Thank you. Okay, so since years we are wondering there's a lot of sun in Greece, there's a lot of wind in Greece, but there's very little investment, there's much more in Germany. And of course you have political choices and things like that. But we have recent studies who show that the capital costs, uh, the spread in the capital costs between Germany and Greece are much bigger than the solar spread. So. Uh, even if there is a bit more sun and maybe at some locations a bit more wind, uh, the problem is that in Greece, but also in Romania, in Bulgaria and so on, you have to pay three, four, five times higher interest rates than in Germany. So in Germany, I'm told, you get financing at two, three, four percent, whereas in Southeast Europe, uh, this is not true. And therefore, I have in order to overcome this basically uh, penalty which some economies get by the uh, capital markets, which is, I think, the country risk. Um, I, I, I have presented something to energy ministers, but before going to that, there is also a difference between Spain and Portugal. Portugal has lower interest rates for wind investments today than for Spain if there is any investment in Spain still. Um, and that is because the Spanish government has done very brutal retroactive changes. And you can imagine, anybody who wants to go to Spain now will, of course, say, this comes with a risk. And therefore, I think in a paper which I have presented to the 28 energy ministers uh, a month ago, so what I call the Luxembourg Declaration, I'm advocating to create, linked to the Juncker Investment Fund, uh, a de-risking fund for those countries which are penalized by the capital markets. And we could start, and we are in talk with uh, Commissioner Sefcovic, to get such a de-risking fund for Southeast Europe. And one of my aims at Paris is, so the same story is even more true, and uh, Cedric just told me, for Africa, you have 15% plus interest rates when you want to invest into wind or, or solar. So imagine we would get in Paris a world, the decision to set up a world guarantee fund which would buy out by guarantees the country risk. Personally, I think that that would be one of the most important outcomes of Paris because that would bring the financial um, conditionalities to get wind, for example, up and running in Namibia and other countries, uh, almost at the level of, of something like Germany. And that could reduce costs for renewables and this also for wind in certain countries by half. So that's, uh, so working more on the capital costs and creating dedicated de-risking instruments is for me one of the key priorities which we need to fix now. What kind of support do you have for this uh, initiative? Um, for Southeast European uh, Renewable Energy Fund, uh, I got support from Slovenia, Romania. We are working on, with Greece, uh, and we have the Commission. So I, I hope that I will get this up and running uh, somewhere uh, 
early, early next year, so that it is established before we, we really go also for the political discussions uh, on the Renewable Directive. There is still not enough support on, in the Balkans, which has, Romania has an extraordinary source of wind, uh, but uh, we need to get these governments more pro, and I think there's two conditions. One is to get the capital costs down, and the second is to reward in the European uh, legislation framework those countries who overachieve. We will see in the next week a first cooperation agreement between Lithuania and Luxembourg, where Lithuania, which will overachieve its target, will uh, transfer some of this target achievement to Luxembourg against a certain sum of money. And uh, in Portugal, in Bulgaria, in Romania, uh, maybe in Ireland, so we have countries which will overachieve the 2020 target, whereas others, like UK or Netherlands, will be late. And so uh, getting this reward culture into the European legislation, uh, so it's already in the legislation, but now we need to get it more easily also administratively, and so, therefore I call for a virtual trading floor between the member states so that it gets much easier to fix these kind of contracts. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm sure we'll uh, discuss uh, other aspects of your uh, initiative. Uh, what is the, um, the website again? It's the Lux Declaration, right? You want to give... Uh... Oh, Luxembourg Declaration, it's a bit... I, I'm from that country, and uh, Luxembourg is, of course, a big financial center, not often um, with a very good image in the last, but Luxembourg is already today, because of the sheer presence of the European Investment Bank, uh, one of the world's biggest places for renewable investment. And we have in Luxembourg 250 dedicated uh, renewable energy funds, or funds which are going into the energy transition. So uh, it's also, uh, in a certain sense, a call for financial actors to not only to understand divestment, but also to, to understand where to invest. And definitely, this is wind, uh, should be a big part of the portfolios of investment funds in the future. Thank you. Okay, um, let's uh, now have a, um, a comparison between uh, the European solution for different uh, uh, financial aspects of wind energy. Um, as you know, uh, Europe has uh, long since uh, relied on the feed-in tariff mechanism for wind and solar uh, power uh, expansion. But this isn't the case uh, in Brazil, uh, Mauricio Tolmaskin. Uh, you've chosen the, the, the auction system. Can you tell us why and tell us how that works? Okay, well... Uh, in my opinion, only a uh, competitive mechanism like power auction uh, can review the real price of an energy source. Uh, we found out in Brazil uh, that wind power uh, current price is one-third of the price we paid in the feeding tariffs. One-third. Uh, the price fell from 15 cents of dollar to five cents of dollar in the last auction. Uh, three reasons for that. Three reasons for that. The first one is not related to the auction system, is that there was uh, technological improvements in the uh, turbines and the equipments, and so you have an uh, increase in efficiency in decreasing price. But the two other uh, uh, causes is the, uh, related to auction system. The first one is that the feed-in tariff mechanism is uh, there is in this system a very big asymmetry between, of information between the electricity authorities and the entrepreneurs. And I can say that because I was the vice minister of energy when we, I, we have to fix a feed-in tariff in Brazil. And the second reason why auction, I think, is better than the feed-in tariffs is that the auction systems allows consumers to have access to uh, the most efficient projects. Uh, the, the project that has the best wind, the project that use the better technology, the project that has access to better condition of financing. 
And uh, Alex, only to be clear, I, I'm not speaking about competition uh, in uh, the wholesale market, in the spot market. What I'm talking about is about uh, competition to obtain PPAs, to obtain long-term contracts. So, uh, in Brazil, uh, the winners of the auctions uh, receive PPAs of 20 years of duration, where the, 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 the revenue is assured in real terms, is adjusted and assured uh, in real terms. And uh, one, another important thing to say is that it's not only uh, the auction system uh, alone, you put the auction system, everything is work. You have to, uh, to make a good auction system, you have to have good contracts. For instance, in Brazil, we make a, a PPA, that's in the PPA, we try to reduce the risk of the investor. How we do that? Well, as you know, uh, the, the wind is variable during the, week, the year, and the investors want a, a, a constant revenue. So uh, uh, we create a, a system that when a very wind year can compensate uh, for one year of Cooper is that uh, which less favorable winds. So uh, you can have four years, let's say the two first years, you don't have good winds, but you can compensate that in the third and the fourth years, but you have your revenue assured in the first two years. And uh, yet uh, we have other instruments that came with the, uh, uh, the auctions. Uh, we have created tax incentives, uh, both for the construction of the, the, the wind farms and uh, tax incentives for setting up uh, the wind uh, power generators uh, factories in Brazil. And we have created two adequate uh, uh, credit lines uh, granted by uh, our National Development Bank uh, that finance the wind farms and the factories too. And we have reduced the, uh, 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 the transmission tariff for wind farms lower than uh, 30 uh, megawatts of capacity. So, uh, as a result of that, in a short period of time, Brazil will uh, uh, increase its installed wind capacity for around five gigawatts in 2014 to 17 gigawatts in 2019. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, with more than 500 wind farms spread all around the country. And only to, to finish this introduction, uh, I normally when I talk about auction, the industries say, oh, I, I don't like it because uh, you are going to have a lower price. I need a higher price. Uh, I think this is a mistake. The auction is good for the consumers and it's good for the investor too because it, it, it uh, uh, fosters the industry to uh, introduce more efficient equipments. And only to give you uh, an example that, uh, that confirmed that my thesis that this is good for industry. Next February, we are going to have uh, a, an auction. Uh, uh, and these auctions, uh, there is applied to participate of these auctions, 864 wind farms projects. I, also, almost 900 projects apply to participate of the auctions, totaling 21 gigawatts of capacity. So, if the investors would lose money, they would not apply to participate of the auction. If they apply, it's because they know they can win money. Uh, so, I think that the auction system is uh, fair. Uh, you have fair price for the consumer, and you have an incentive for the industry to be uh, more efficient. 
Any, just quickly, any reactions to that? Would you like to, uh, Claude Thomas, I saw, I saw you watching uh, uh, Mauricio with a mixture of uh, fascination but uh, puzzlement. What, what uh, lessons to be taken for Europe? We have in Europe, of course, a discussion on how to move from very stable, low-risk uh, systems like feed-in and premium over to auctions. Uh, for offshore wind, uh, Denmark has shown that you can do it. Uh, for onshore wind, uh, we will now seek a test case in Germany. Uh, personally, I'm good. I, I, we will look at that. Uh, the one aspect which I don't know if, if you are aware in Brazil, in Germany, 80% um, of all wind turbines were built by citizens, by farmers, or by small project developers. So the question is, how much complexity is auctioning introducing? And um, onshore wind, so we have seen the ADEM 100% scenario. And onshore wind is, of course, the biggest. But then they have a small asterisk saying, this potential is depending on the social acceptance. So one question which I have no answer to is, what if citizens, cooperatives, we have several hundreds, if not thousands of them, what if citizens' cooperatives don't win auctions and then we lose basically the most proactive citizens support when wind turbine uh, projectors come. So I'm, uh, in a certain sense, a bit more reluctant. Uh, I, and, and there's a second difference between Europe and Brazil. You have a market which is growing, so your electricity demand is going up. In Europe, our electricity demand is not only flat, it's going down. France, electricity demand 2014 went down 7%. And the industry in France had a relatively good year. So in Europe, we have very tough and good eco-design, labeling, and so on. And so we, we are saving electricity. And we, have no, we are confronted with a huge overcapacity. So the market, the wholesale market in Europe, in Scandinavia, is below 25. Who invests in the power in a wind turbine below 25? Show up your hand. <laughs> There's nobody in the room who will invest for 25. And in Germany, it's now below 35. So um, our markets are broken. ETS has largely failed. Politically, it will be very, very difficult to fix it. So we need continuous support also after 2020. And then, of course, we have to discuss how much in this can be auctions. And I want at least an option opened to get uh, Easy de risking close to citizens, um, maybe premium still possible, and not uh, throwing everything, all my eggs in one basket, and then afterwards see that too many of the eggs are broken. Right, okay, thank you very much for that uh, uh, debate. Let's uh, move on now to uh, talk about uh, NL Green Power with uh, Francesco Venturini, uh, your renewable uh, energy company operating uh, in 17 countries, not only uh, in Europe, uh, but also in the Americas, Africa, and also uh, recently, I think you've started uh, uh, investing in, in Asia. Could you tell us something, first of all, about uh, your uh, growth uh, strategy and uh, what is the place uh, of Europe in your strategy? Um, we, uh, as you said, are in 17 or 18 countries. I'm not sure exactly where we are today. Um, about uh, 10 gigawatt uh, going for 11 uh, um, of installed capacity around the world. 60% of this is, uh, is wind. The, um, we uh, obviously go where the uh, opportunities are uh, under investment uh, point of view. And I think that uh, in the past two or three years, uh, uh, we haven't seen very many opportunities in Europe. So we have mostly uh, diversified uh, into uh, emerging, uh, emerging markets. Um, mostly because in reality, uh, the North American market uh, is still very important in our strategy and we are still investing probably 30, 40% of the 2 billion euros that we invest on a yearly basis um, in North America. Um, 
why is Europe uh, not a great market uh, for us anymore? I think it's, it's pretty evident. On, on one side, uh, the uh, uh, economic crisis uh, uh, hit very, uh, very hard. Uh, consumption uh, went down, so probably there is uh, overcapacity. But uh, I think also um, there is uh, uh, a missing element, uh, which is uh, uh, long-term long price uh, mechanisms. Uh, we cannot forget that uh, we uh, build infrastructure. And to build an infrastructure, you need to understand uh, that uh, uh, the money is going to be back uh, in, uh, in, in the long term, so 15, 20 years. We cannot uh, um, live with uncertainty. It's very difficult. Uh, we are not talking about uh, big margins in this business. Uh, margins are getting uh, uh, lower and lower. Uh, the only thing that uh, you can, uh, at least you, you, you need to make sure that uh, it's out there, is the certainty of the fact that uh, the flows uh, of cash are coming back in the long term, assuming that you're doing uh, your things in the right way. Um, and uh, in Europe, Long term being how long? I, again, I mean, depending on the technology, you're talking about between 15 and 30 years. Uh, hydro, geothermal, uh, you're probably closer to the 30. Uh, solar wind, uh, you're between 15 and 20, usually. Um, I'm, I am, I'm European, I'm Italian, obviously, so it's, it's very sad that, that uh, uh, more than 90% of those uh, 2 billion euros that were invested on an yearly basis uh, are right now going uh, uh, in other, uh, in other uh, continents. Uh, one of our uh, favorite targets lately has been uh, Brazil, because uh, um, they definitely have a very um, complete and well-organized scheme. Uh, we are big investors in Brazil in both wind, solar, and, uh, and hydro. Uh, we would like to come back in Europe. I think that uh, Europe is living is a uh, uh, midlife uh, crisis. Um, probably uh, we need a little bit uh, to uh, understand that the world, uh, a little bit more to understand that the world has changed. Um, and I, I don't think that the, this, this battle between uh, uh, feeding tariff and, uh, and uh, auctions or tenders uh, is, uh, is relevant. Uh, at the end, uh, it's more a matter of strategy. I mean, where, where does Europe want to go? And then uh, uh, feeding tariff and, uh, and tenders are just uh, uh, instruments to get to uh, a certain target. Uh, where is the target right now is not, is not really clear to me, and I think that's, that's going to be part of the discussion today. Um, we in Europe mostly are investing now in, uh, in technologies that are not uh, uh, so much wind-based. Uh, I would say geothermal is, is one. Uh, Italy is uh, uh, benefits of the fact that uh, geothermal fluid is, is, is abundant. Uh, we're investing in biomass uh, in Europe, and we're waiting for this... Uh, renaissance period uh, in, in Europe to uh, start investing once again uh, in, uh, in wind and, uh, and in solar. We see the first uh, signals. Uh, hopefully in the next couple of years we're going to be able to uh, come back here. When you talk about a, a midlife uh, crisis, just one question. Um, I host a lot of these uh, European things, and uh, there's, 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 as always in European uh, questions, there's problems of harmonization. We don't have the same approach to energy from one country to another. To what extent is that a handicap, or is it the same in other parts of the world? Is, is, is there a very different approach to energy in Africa with all their with different countries and so forth? To what extent uh, is there a specific European problem that we don't agree on a lot of the, the, the basics? Um, I, I I think that the fact that uh, uh, rules are so different from one country to another one, uh, it is a problem. Um, at the same time, uh, the uh, European economies are big economies, so uh, we could be able to handle it. We have been handling it for, uh, for, for a while. Uh, what really uh, was uh, the big mistake that was made in Europe was uh, retroactive changes. I mean, that, that really hurt uh, this, uh, this industry in a very bad way. So I, I heard that we're talking about Romania. We just had to run an impairment for 150 million euros uh, uh, during this quarter because of the fact that uh, rules uh, have changed. Uh, um, and they, uh, the, the, the worst thing that they have changed when uh, um, the, the, the prices of power uh, were going down. So at the same time, you, you got hit from uh, uh, prices going down and at the same time, uh, you know, uh, feeding tariffs uh, or subsidies in general. Uh, being cut. 
uh, that was probably the biggest, uh, the biggest mistake we made. All right, okay, well, let's uh, have a look at uh, Vestas now. Uh, we, you're the CEO of Vestas, Anders uh, Runavad. Uh, so we've had various uh, uh, projections uh, in the short and long term about uh, wind energy, um, but it's, it's definitely becoming a more dominant source of energy. Why for you? And what's, your, what's Vestas' uh, uh, perspective on the future of wind? Yeah, I think the, the simple answer is that it makes uh, economical sense. So uh, the competitiveness of wind has really improved and, and it's, it's really there. So uh, wind power is economically very feasible, uh, no fuel cost and, and no price volatility. We heard about, um, I mean, the, the levelized cost of energy varies between regions. We, we heard about Brazil. Uh, U.S. Uh, around $60 per megawatt hour, uh, Europe around $70 to $90 uh, dollars per megawatt hour. So onshore wind is already in the same range as coal and gas in many markets today. So for me that's the primary reason for uh, wind starting to become mainstream and actually last year of new addition globally, wind was about 20%. Uh, second, uh, of course, it's clean. Um, it's uh, readily available and carbon free. So uh, uh, typical Vestas turbine repates its uh, lifetime carbon footprint in about six months. And then, of course, provides decades of zero pollution energy. So affordable, clean, then also uh, address a concern on energy security. Um, wind actually improves national energy security and, and reduce import risk. It's a, it's a natural domestic resource and, um, and last but not least, it's actually also water free. And I think that uh, will grow in importance as we see droughts uh, in many parts of the world. And uh, contrary to then many fossil fuel and also nuclear uh, based power uh, generation actually consumes an enormous amount of water. So uh, I think all in all it's clear that wind provides clean, cheap energy and does it quickly. So it simply makes both uh, a financial and environmental uh, good choice. Well, what is your current state of uh, uh, investment in wind and your, your strategy? What, what, uh, tell us a little bit about, about your, your, your medium and long-term strategy. Our strategy, I mean, and, and the key focus for Vestas is to continue to drive down the levelized cost of energy. I think for us, that is the enabler for growth that's uh, enabled to further penetrate uh, both in mature market and in new market. I agree with what was discussed before. I think there is a difference between mature market where energy consumption actually is flat or, or even declining because that's a replacement market and that has um, its specific characteristic. And then you have uh, the market where actually the energy consumption is increasing. And that, that is more a like-for-like -like comparison to compare new build to new build. So there are two types of markets. Uh, and therefore, they have to be handled a little bit differently. But for us, uh, to continue to lowering the levelized cost of energy is the key enabler for, uh, for growing uh, the wind overall, but certainly for Vestas. Right, okay. Last but not least, Cédric Philibert from the uh, International uh, Energy Agency. You've been uh, listening uh, to the other contributors. Um, I saved you for the end because I think it would be interesting uh, if you give us your perspective on wind uh, in the next few years and in the slightly more long term. How, how does uh, your agency see wind? What, what kind of, give us some concrete figures of, of your projection. All right, uh, thank you. L let me instead start with the longer term perspective and then go backward, if you don't mind. Uh, we have made a number of scenarios that are climate friendly. That means they are 
supposed to be compatible or providing a reasonable prospect that we won't go beyond two degrees beyond pre-industrial times in global uh, average temperature. Uh, in those scenarios, we have a lot of renewable first in the power sector. By 2050, um, the, the share of renewables ran from 65 to 80 percent, depending on the prospects we have on basically uh, nuclear and uh, carbon uh, capture and storage uh, when using fossil fuels. So we need to first decarbonize the power sector. When you, we, we go even beyond this 2050, we need even more renewables and more electricity to wipe out the uh, um, um, use of fossil fuels in the end-use sectors, in buildings, in transport, and in industry. But this is beyond 2050. So let's stop at 2050, 65 to 80 percent renewables. Of these, there are three big chunks. Hydropower, which is firm, flexible, and has a great number of qualities. Um, I'm sure Thomas knows that very well. Uh, uh, Mauricio knows that very well. Uh, then we have uh, solar, which will be made of a mix of PV and solar thermal electricity, because it's more expensive, but it can be stored uh, before generating, the heat can be stored before generating electricity, so it has a big advantage. And then wind, and wind will be uh, basically 25% offshore and 75% uh, uh, land-based at the time. Uh, so we have a huge amount of variable renewables. Now when you go into the different regions of the world, of course these mixes are quite different. In Latin America, there is so much hydropower that wind and solar will be there, but not, uh, not enormous. Uh, of course, in uh, Africa or Middle East, solar will dominate. What a surprise. Now, when you go to Europe, uh, you see that we have a shape of demand that is uh, peaky in, after the sunset, and especially in winter. And this fits well with the wind power, and much less so with the solar. And solar, we can store the solar energy from noon to midnight, but we cannot store it easily with a good efficiency and at affordable cost for now from uh, summer to winter. So in all our models, and, and it's the same for Fraunhofer, for uh, ADEM, etc., we have much more wind power in uh, Europe than we will have from solar power. Um, and uh, one thing that is very important is to make this deployment of wind power as system-friendly as possible. When you start integrating wind power, it's, it's relatively easy. It creates problem with incumbents when you don't have growth in, in uh, uh, electric consumption, but, but technically uh, it's not that difficult. And it has been done very efficiently in Denmark, but also in Ireland, in the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, when, you, when you go for more uh, wind power in, in those mixes, uh, you have a, a, a problem of value. You have a self-cannibalization effect. If uh, you have a lot of wind and all this wind is generated in the same time, uh, its marginal value falls because you have too much at this point, and at other times, you, you don't have enough. So we need to make this production as, even, uh, as evenly distributed as we can. And this is the current tendency in the industry, I think uh, we'll have confirmation of that, going to um, a new generation of turbines with uh, low specific ratings. That is, you have machines that are taller, uh, with longer blades, um, uh, larger uh, swept areas, but the same or only slightly increased uh, electrical capacities. And that means that you get uh, very much higher capacity factors, but more importantly, you get a more even output over time, which prevents this self cannibalization effect to, uh, to occur, and which, uh, uh, again, it has much higher value uh, for the system in, in that it, it uh, uh, reduces the weight that uh, uh, rests on the shoulder of the rest of the system, whether it is hydropower or uh, hydropower and thermal and, and the like. 
Um, so it's important that we give the right signals to this de deployment. Um, and that's why, in a way, we, we cannot only go with flat fit-in tariffs. Uh, for, we need to have two different uses of market forces here. One is to have some use of the short-term uh, instantaneous uh, uh, market signals that tells you the value of your electricity uh, today at this hour and maybe in this location is very high or is not very high. So you manage progressively to develop systems that have a higher value. So we, we can incorporate this short-term market signals. That's what the European is trying to do by moving from fit-in tariff to fit-in premium that associate a premium to the market price. However, you cannot rest only on this short-term signal because it basically carries only the uh, short-run marginal costs. And it really doesn't work with technologies that are very capital intensive. If you had to do a development of wind or uh, solar farms based only on market, short-term market signals, it, 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 well, we have three plants of the sort, I think, in the world. Uh, two in Chile, one in the US. And they have been built because the uh, 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 market price was twice as high at the uh, cost of uh, the, the, the solar or the wind at the time. So it's a, it, and the window is closed now. So it's not possible to build a plant because then you run into what uh, Claude described uh, with you, you, you get huge capital costs if it's so risky to build on the expectation that you will have good returns on investment over the next 20 years. Uh, uh, no lender will lend you any money at less than 15 or 20 uh, percent interest rate if it's so risky, even if you have reduced the technology risk, even if you have uh, reduced the political risk or the country risks, you will still have these big market risks if you base all your expectations only on short-term uh, marginal signals. But they are important, or you have to structure your PPAs. Uh, you need, at some point, a long-term power purchase agreement. I fully concur with Mauricio on that. Uh, and you have two options there. One is to uh, have a PPA plus a market signal. That's what Europeans are trying to do with the fill-in premium. Or uh, you need to structure your, your PPA with time of use or real-time pricing, uh, any kind, any sort of time-based pricing to tell the developers that um, uh, the system needs electricity uh, at 7 o'clock in the evening and in winter and not so much on Sunday afternoon at, at, uh, at, at noon uh, in, in, in the summer. So it's important to, get, to, to try to enter in this world with a, with a combination of instruments to reduce the risks, um, um, but to, to take in due consideration the, the capital intensive nature of any low carbon technology. Thank Anybody you. want to uh, react on the, the Claude? Do you want to say something about pricing, uh, the, the, the short term and the, the, the longer term? So, and uh, the challenge for Europe for, for next year or the next two, three years is, uh, first, we have to define what kind of ambition we want in renewables. 27% renewables in the uh, energy mix in Europe is a very low ambition. And I just make you aware that tomorrow the European Commission will, will uh, deliver, will say, Europe will move to 30% energy efficiency which means we will have more energy efficiency than what was in the original planning of Commission when they came out with the 27, 27, 40%. So if Commission moves next year to, to have a more ambitious efficiency policy and we have a strong support in the Parliament and so on for that, that means if we don't change the 27% for renewables, the share, the volume of renewable investment in Europe will go down. And I think that would be a disastrous message, uh, knowing also that the dynamism in renewables is today much bigger in the American, in the Chinese, in the Brazilian market than in Europe. The world renewables investments have grown by 15%, whereas in Europe it's, it's flat. So the first thing which we have to get is more ambition. Second thing is um, we need governance. And uh, governance means, I think, we need a responsibility for national governments. Because no, so if there is not national policymakers who defend the wind turbine investment, 
don't believe that Mr. Savkovich or somebody from Europe can, can, can move the citizens to accept also this kind of infrastructure. Well, why not? I thought that was supposed to be the point of the... Yeah, be, of, because, the, because, because if because there's one thing that uh, Europe is supposed to be good for, it's en everybody says no, it's no, good but, for the but, environment and energy. Yeah, but come on, uh, a European commissioner, physically, he is not able to, do, to go to all the projects and to defend them. Because you need to clone him and, and multiply him by 30 or 40. Uh, good. And, and the second is national and local policymakers have much closer ties to the citizens. So, and, and it's also about infrastructure. It's not Europe who will decide where, which line, especially as the distribution level will be built. So renewables are only possible if you have also infrastructure. So this push by the Margaret Group of the big power companies who basically tried to destroy the system which I had put in place, which was national targets, national support spins, plus cooperation mechanisms. This is a very bad push because it will destabilize the investment security. And if you say from Enel or from Enel uh, Green Power that 90% of your investments are outside of Europe and you are sad about it, sorry, what has Enel done to help people like me to get a higher ambition in Brussels and to get a stronger government system. Because your chairman, Mr. Storace, and the before one, was campaigning with Mestralet and others to kill the renewable uh, target for 2030 and to go against a strong government. So we have, and, and that's also the reality, in Europe we are doubting. And so those who doubt most are the big energy oligopolies. And I can only hope that they will give up their opposition to speed up the energy revolution. I hope that Enel will stop being in Brussels an actor against strong renewable governments, against strong ambition, and finally embrace this change. Uh, because otherwise, we will see a lost decade in Europe. And I'm, I don't, because then I get to the next question. How will Vestas, whose home market is Europe, how will you be competitive against the Chinese competitors a 20 gigawatt home market if we in Europe don't have a home market which is growing. So what is your strategy okay, to be well, better let's, than let's, the Chinese let's give them the opportunity uh, if, if, to uh, if there is no home market? Themselves, uh, uh, from NL, uh, uh, he's taking over. <laughs> um, I'm, 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 the acoustic is very bad, but I'm, I'm not sure I understood. You, you, are, you are claiming that um, NL didn't support uh, uh, you or whoever in, uh, in, change, in, in increasing the, the level of renewables in, uh, in Europe? I, 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 that's, that's the question. I mean, just uh, I, I think that we are at the point where may, maybe the previous management uh, wasn't so pushy, but I think that we are very pushy. I mean, we, we pledged to be carbon free by uh, 2050 as uh, uh, a company. And we own something like uh, probably more than 50 gigawatts of conventional power around the world. So I think that as a commitment towards renewables, uh, uh, we have a very big commitment, uh, probably one of the biggest and most important commitments uh, around the world, especially as, uh, as a utility. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure that uh, uh, we, we, we are discussing about uh, uh, the, 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 the right thing. I mean, again, there are two different markets, mature and emerging, let's put it in this way, and there are two different roles, uh, politicians uh, and investors. So investors uh, need to have uh, a low degree of uncertainty, especially in uh, the infrastructure world, uh, to make sure that there is a payback uh, in a decent amount of years. Um, the, the problem with Europe uh, has been the fact that the uncertainty level has been growing uh, very high in the past few years. Not in all the countries, but in a lot of them. So obviously this with a, slow, uh, with a, with a, um, a slower economy uh, drove us uh, outside of Europe. Now, we would love to come back and invest in Europe. I'm a European, so I mean, obviously um, uh, it, it, it would be a great thing. But uh, I, I really believe that uh, we need uh, a clear vision in Europe about what needs to be done. And again, feeding tariff or PPA then are just tools eventually to support the industry, the private sector, towards those, uh, those goals. Um, 
I, again, I don't understand very well the difference between uh, feed-in tariff and PPA, meaning that uh, uh, at the end, uh, uh, they are both tools. Uh, there are cases, uh, it's strange, I mean, there are cases like Egypt, where they are adopted uh, at the same time. Uh, so tenders are utilized to set a lower price, and then uh, feed-in tariff uh, is utilized to create, uh, um, to build capacity. So I think there are, there are situations uh, out in the world that we can copy from. Um, one thing that uh, I would uh, accuse Europe uh, uh, to be is to be a little bit too, um, to look too much inside. Uh, instead of looking at what's happening uh, around the world a little bit more. Uh, there are some things that we are convinced that we have done right uh, and we will never change. Uh, but I believe that countries like uh, Brazil, South Africa, and even uh, the North African countries are doing something innovative in the way they're approaching the, uh, the renewable issue uh, or the energy issue in general. And we probably should take uh, something from them. Yeah, good. But there is a difference, and it was spelled out, we have markets which are replacement markets and we have growing markets and Europe is a replacement market. Our, our problem is we have too much coal in the system, we have too much nuclear in the system and therefore basically an, 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 uh, somebody who is strong in its own market like let's say ADF in France will not be very pushy to do a maximum of wind investment in France because it will cannibalize its own, and it's the same. So we have a very specific situation in Europe and we need to get a much more ambitious targets for 2030 and we need to reward flexibility. And then third, we need in a certain sense to have a strategy to phase out the huge overcapacity which we have in the system. Because otherwise, we will, I, I tell you, otherwise we go for a lost decade. Well, I, you see, at the end we agree. We need to have a clear vision of what the future needs to, be, to, to look like. But again, that's not up to us. It's up to uh, politicians to have a clear vision, and then it's up to us to uh, make it happen. We have one, no? <laughs> so <laughs> and help us to understand exactly where we're going, and we'll be more than happy to invest in Europe. Anders uh, Runovat, would you like to uh, defend uh, Vestas? Yeah. Um, no, but I definitely agree on all those three points. And, and uh, of course, uh, we are a European-based company, Vestas. Uh, I'm also European. So, and, and I think it's also uh, to give credit also to Europe. I think uh, Europe created this industry and, and actually uh, also made it competitive over time by being a market and, and provided subsidies so this industry could mature, so the technology could come down in price uh, and therefore reach the competitiveness that we have today. So I think when you have done an investment and you are almost there, you shouldn't stop because of course it has also created quite a lot of workplace for, um, for European companies. So, from Vesta's point of view, of course, we hope for the three points that we discussed with a clear vision, a solid target, and, and a big um, uh, European market. Having said that, of course, um, we are also a global company, and uh, of course, we are present in 74 markets overall. Uh, we have a presence in the market that you mentioned as well. We are present in Brazil, present in China, and so on. But uh, so, of course, for us to make sure that we uh, have a stable delivery, uh, of course, uh, a key strategy for us is to be a company with global reach because we recognize the facts that markets go a bit up and down. And as long as you are present in many markets, you can hedge your bets a bit. Okay, well, so we've had a look at the uh, general situation of wind and the uh, difference between uh, geographical uh, uh, approaches. Um, I'd like just now to uh, have a look at um, a short uh, contribution from uh, Mathieu Orphelin, who is the spokesperson for Nicolas Hulot, the special envoy of uh, the, the French uh, president, uh, François Hollande, uh, for, the, for the protection of the planet. As you know, he was supposed to be here, but uh, he has a very good excuse, as you will see. But uh, he, f he filmed uh, this short contribution, uh, which I think uh, would be interesting to hear your views on. Uh, let's have a listen now to uh, Mathieu Orphelin. Uh, 
Voilà. Ce projet éolien a permis à la communauté de communes en partenariat. I would like to say on behalf of the Oswald company we've managed to set up a territorial development project for the two prongs of sustainable development that's economic development and social development that I would call well-being. Mathieu recorded this thing. Do we have... Uh, no, we don't have Mathieu Orphelin? Oh, right. Okay. Yes, we do. Mathieu Orphelin est avec nous. Mathieu Orphelin will be with us in a few seconds. He, oh, let me tell you why he wasn't here. He was supposed to be coming. He rang up last night because, um, because of the COP21 uh, security uh, aspects, because of what happened in Paris uh, uh, on Friday. He was called uh, to the, uh, by the president. Uh, uh, there's a meeting today about security aspects for the COP21, so it seems a very good uh, excuse uh, for him not uh, to be here. Est-ce qu'on a la vidéo ou pas The interpreters don't have the sound input in our headsets. We do apologize. The video is being screened and can be heard in the room, but not through the interpreter's headsets. We apologize for that. Renforcé dans le contexte terrible des attentats, cette COP21, c'est l'occasion de montrer que le monde. On the occasion of the COP21, it's an opportunity to show that we're on the par with the challenges ahead of us and that we can pick up the gauntlet of climate change and build a better future together. Renewable energy sources, especially wind, are in the very heart of the solutions that must be implemented by the different countries. It's rather... Uh, perturbing sometimes because renewable energies are actually the main tool described in the contributions and the commitments given country by country, the famous INDCs, but at the same time, you don't find the words renewable energy in the draft Paris uh, text to be adopted, and it's one of the main solutions nonetheless. So a few uh, simple messages I'd like to share with you today. Firstly, 2014 is a real step change in the world of energy. Firstly, because we're finally investing more in renewables than in non-renewable energy sources, and also we're investing more in renewable energies in developing countries as opposed to the developed world. So this is a twofold switch of a sort, which is very important, which is happening right now, which will further flesh out and crystallize the massive development of renewables, which are one of the main responses to the challenges of climate change. Renewable energies, as I was saying, are indeed in the center stage of the national commitments given by many, many countries. I'm thinking in particular of China, India, who have uh, regarding energy efficiency, perhaps who have given commitments whereby they could, we think they could have gone further. But regarding renewable energy sources, I must say it is the salient point that strikes one in terms of the contributions uh, from the different countries, the place of renewables, especially solar power and wind power too, in their contributions, nationally speaking. The third point I'd like to make is that finally the scenario with massive development of renewable energy sources aren't taboo anymore. In France, we've seen this with the 100% renewable energy, uh, uh, renewable electricity scenario. But there are countries like China too, where at the moment there are scenarios which are 100% renewable energy on the table. So let's just imagine the path we've trodden on over the last few years, we have made huge strides forward. Now, the role of funding will be important. The role of banks will be important. Funding and financing in general. We've got to flank this massive financing uh, that must be done. We must channel it towards renewable energy source. And the banks must play their rightful role here. They're not doing it fully for the moment. Uh, last week, a study that came out showed us that, on average, the large global banks invest seven times more still in fossil fuel energy sources as opposed to renewable energies. They've got to fast track the change. They've got to make the change too. And the financial players will have to ring the changes and assume their rightful role in the energy transition we want to move towards. And the last point is the citizen 
financing and funding of energies, renewable energy sources, especially wind power. This is something we've absolutely got to foster and develop, especially in France. We've got to promote this. That's why we've been pushing for uh, Nicolas Hulot's ideas to pan out, to crystallize uh, such possibilities. And this is the way to go. We've got to enable citizens to take ownership of the energy issues, especially via renewables, and invest personally in uh, wind turbines uh, close by where they live, uh, as opposed to things happening over their heads that they don't understand anything of. So they are the fine signals out there for renewable energies. I think it should all help us to get on the right track towards abating uh, global warming, keep the temperature elevation to just two degrees. We're not there yet. We're far from it. That's why the Paris Agreement will be very important, because we've got to allocate the right resources to gradually getting us all on the right track to limit uh, warming to two degrees increase, so as to make planet Earth more easy to live in than what might happen uh, if we continue the way we're going. So thank you to all of you for mobilizing your efforts and meet you again soon to build up a fine future together. Thank you. Uh, Ofala from the uh, Nicolas Hulot, uh, um, who's the uh, special envoy of uh, the, uh, the French uh, president. Um, let's now talk specifically, as he said, uh, about what's going to happen in two or weeks uh, in Paris for the COP21. Um, what, uh, do you agree with him that uh, there's, there's not going to be enough uh, written down about uh, wind and, and renewables generally? Um, let's start with uh, Mauricio, for example. What, uh, uh, what are the Brazilian targets specifically for COP21? Uh, OK, uh, first of all, I would like to, to say that Brazil has one of the most renewable energy metrics in the world. 45% of our energy metrics came from renewable, while in the world, the average is 13%, and if you take the OCD countries, it's only 9%. When we talk about the power system, uh, the difference is greater. Uh, in Brazil, 80% of the power generation came from renewables, while in the world, uh, only 20% come from renewable. 60% of the power generation in Brazil are hydro, only 3% are coal. In the world, 40% of the generation are coal. So uh, we have, well, uh, the big challenge for Brazil is how to, to grow the, the economy, maintaining the high level of uh, renewables that we already have in our energy metrics and in our power metrics. Uh, uh, so Brazil was the only emerging country that announced an absolute reduction in greenhouse gas emission. You know that the other emerging countries has announced that they would stabilize the uh, energy intensity or emission intensity. This means that, uh, in fact, they uh, accept to grow the emissions in absolute terms. Brazil say that they are going to reduce in absolute terms the emissions. So our plan is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to 37% below 2005 levels uh, by 2025 and to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to 43% below 2005 levels uh, by 2030. So it's a very important uh, goal. Uh, uh, and in order to achieve these goals, uh, we intend to increase the share of sustainable bioenergy in the energy mix to 18% in 2030. I'm talking about ethanol. You know, we have in Brazil a very important program of ethanol. All the cars in Brazil use a mist of gasoline and ethanol, and there are some cars that run with 100% of ethanol. And uh, biodiesel and the use of sugar cane and others uh, and wood to generate electricity. And in with, uh, uh, with regard to the electric sector, uh, the goal is more than double the share of new renewables. I mean by new renewables is 
solar, biomass, and wind. So we are not taking consideration hydro, that still is already huge in Brazil. I talk about only new renewables, so I'm going to, uh, our intention is to more than double this, this capacity, uh, this generation. So the goal is that in 2030, 23% of electricity generation in Brazil is from new renewables. Uh, uh, and wind power is the main source that uh, we allow Brazil to achieve this goal. By the end of 2014, wind power count, I'll count only for 2% of the electricity generation. And our goal is that this participation will increase until 2030 uh, five times. So uh, we hope in Brazil that with these uh, uh, targets, Brazil will incentivate, encourage other countries, emerging and developed countries, to do the same and try to, to, be, uh, to put uh, important targets to, uh, to the future. Cédric uh, Philibert, what are you expecting uh, at the COP21, uh, especially in terms of renewables and wind? Well, the first thing to say, I guess, is that if you look into the uh, draft agreement, you will not see renewable energy mentioned, not even energy. And this has infuriated a number of NGOs or observers throughout the world. But you have to realize that the negotiation is about greenhouse gas emissions. And obviously, uh, the, part, the energy sector is the first sector uh, for greenhouse gas emissions. So when countries announce that they will reduce their emissions or they will reduce the growth of emissions or uh, Brazil is the only big emerging country that has said a, a, a reduction from current levels by 2025. But others have said, have announced a peak South Africa first, then China has announced a peak by 2030 or earlier, if possible. Uh, so they're not all uh, announcing just a, a slowing of the growth, like India still does or others. Uh, when, when countries announce something on the emissions, behind that, obviously, you have policies uh, uh, in energy sector, also in other sectors, in uh, deforestation or reforestation, land use change, also in waste management, also in some industries for some uh, exotic gases. But the bulk of it is energy. And a country that takes on a commitment to reduce its emissions will have a number of action in the, in the sector of energy. And basically, when you look at the INDC, there you find renewable energy and energy efficiency improvement. And basically, 40% uh, um, of these INDC have very specific targets in terms of uh, uh, renewables. So uh, you don't see the renewables in the highest level of the negotiations, but they are all behind. And in fact, my feeling is that, well, our analysis is that if, if the tone of the conversation in Paris is already so much different than the tone in Copenhagen. Uh, it's because uh, the uh, uh, big improvements made in cost for renewables, because now all countries, all governments understand that they have some way to go to do actions that are either cheap or fully profitable, that also respond to their needs to improve the air quality of their citizens, uh, to improve uh, the energy security, uh, tapping into their own domestic resources, also in developing domestic industries as much as possible, etc. So, the, really, the context has changed because now governments understand, see the climate change mitigation efforts not only as a cost imposed upon us, as a risk for their economic development, but to the opposite, as an opportunity for their economic development and as a chance to uh, uh, solve a, a number of problems more or less altogether. Again, to some extent, uh, uh, not all these countries will take on a commitment to uh, 
uh, get rid of fossil fuel in, 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 ten, in 10 years or even in 30 years because they don't know and we don't know uh, how we, can, we go to the 100% renewable in energy. We know maybe how technically we could go to 100% renewable in uh, power sector. It's relatively easy in countries that have 60% hydropower. It's already much more difficult for countries that have 7% hydropower. Uh, they could do it technically, but that doesn't mean this is the thing to do because it's more important to decarbonize to some extent the entire uh, energy scene uh, with the end use sectors. Um, and we don't know exactly where we can go. But what we know now is that we can do a lot of, of way towards decarbonization in a way that it will not be a pain in the neck, but which will solve and, and provide multiple benefits, and this is what is changing. And this has much to do with the big reduction in cost we've seen uh, in, in wind and uh, PV industries. Right, uh, Claude uh, Thomas, I imagine that you are going to be here uh, in two weeks' time uh, in Paris. Yeah. Just tell us, um, and I'll come down to the audience now for any questions or remarks, but while I'm going down, are you optimistic or pessimistic about the role of renewables and wind in the, in the declaration uh, yeah. So, and what, what Cedric said is exactly also my perception. The big change between Copenhagen and Paris is that we, we have much more focus on the solutions and the solutions have become cheaper. And then, basically, I have, I owe you a big thank you because it's Vestas, it's Siemens, it's uh, Alstom GE, it's your engineers who have helped us to bring down costs. And the second thank you, basically, I have to give it to myself because it is Europe with its renewable energy laws, very voluntaristic laws. We have created over the last four or five years the market for PV and then the Chinese copied it. We have created since years markets for onshore wind and I want offshore wind now to be the next big bang. Uh, and I'm working with the Belgian ministers and the commission to get really uh, much more investments into the so that's that's the game changer and then what can be done concretely one is a clear vision the vision is going to 100 uh, percent and of course in the power sector first because that will ease uh, then uh, the electrification of transport and so on uh, second is uh, the reduced of capital re reduction of capital costs in europe and outside europe that's the uh, idea of a world renewable de-risking fund linked to the climate finance fund which will be decided. Three, and that's linked also to that, is divestment of banks away from fossil over to renewables. And four is technical assistance uh, by IEA and by IRENA to those governments who are, uh, have still to learn on how to set up really these policies. Uh, and so, and these four things, I think, they can be done, and uh, they should be done. Right, we have a question here. If I could uh, ask you to introduce yourself uh, each time. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Theodore Holton. My company is Wind Farm Analytics. And uh, my question, well, it con it's concerned, well, I'm interested in your opinions on the following. Um, you know, we're doing very well with lowering the cost of wind, but um, it was mentioned in your discussion already, we don't control the wind, we can't control the weather, so uh, we need to handle the variability of wind. And actually, it's not about delivering flat wind power, because after all, demand is not flat. We need controllable delivery of renewable energy. And there's a simple answer, which is tried and tested since 50 years, um, on a large scale, such as you could dam a valley within the UK, which would have uh, sufficient volume and height difference for 40 gigawatts, that's UK average demand, for a week, one large valley. It's possible from an engineering perspective. And there are hundreds of valleys in Britain. So from a planning perspective, it ought to be a reasonable compromise. So I would argue, and I'm interested in your opinion, shouldn't we be um, deploying much more pumped storage, which is the current day viable large-scale energy storage, in order to enable more ambition? 
and we feel your pain, NL, because there's, not, not, there's no price signals for, for you to invest uh, in sufficient energy storage. Actually, um, people talk about capacity market and give you a price signal to invest in gas, maybe. This should be forbidden. Gas, gas deployment in new capacity markets to handle the variability of renewable energy should be forbidden. Capacity markets should be purely renewable, or maybe, if you're cautious, 50% uh, renewable to start with. Thank you. Thank you very much for that very vibrant uh, speech. Uh, uh, how would you react, uh, Enel? Okay, um, I think that we are mixing up uh, uh, the private sector with uh, the politics here a little bit. Um, I was listening to uh, the guy who was speaking before, and he was uh, referring to the banking system and saying that, that they invest too much in conventional energy. Uh, the banking system goes, uh, uh, follows the money. So if uh, the rules are such where conventional energy is uh, more convenient under a financial point of view than renewables, uh, it's obvious that the banking system uh, is going to fund uh, the conventional generation. So again, politicians uh, and politics in general is uh, giving, providing the vision, is, is, is deciding what the targets are, is creating the environment in such a way that uh, investors then can go invest the money and make uh, a fair return. Um, so if uh, the laws uh, in a specific place uh, uh, are supporting conventional energy, uh, by the way, NL doesn't invest uh, in new conventional energy anymore, and uh, this has been happening for more than two years now. Um, the, uh, it's obvious that investors uh, will, uh, will go after it. So let's be very careful on, on separating the two things. So if, if, again, there is a vision and there are rules, there are laws, there is a strategy that uh, um, makes the private sector going after renewables, uh, obviously there is going to be a big support. If the laws are weak or the rules are unclear or there is a lot of uncertainty, then that's where problems kick in and uh, you look at investing in places where rules are a little bit more clear. If I may add a few words on this, uh, I think the gentleman in the, from the floor is, is perfectly right. Uh, we will need all uh, dimensions of flexibility. One is to have uh, the wind power as flat as possible, but that's only one part of the story. The other story is to have grid and grid strengthening and no uh, electric island in, in Europe, uh, while currently we have about four. Um, so we need grid strengthening. Uh, to uh, cancel out the viability of both demand and generation uh, as much as we can. Uh, we need flexible generation, uh, at least uh, in the interim period, but we need, we'll need storage. And today, the uh, uh, affordable option for storage is pumped hydro. And, and uh, fortunately, we can build on the legacy of the nuclear age where we have built those pumped hydro to make flexible the nuclear that was not flexible. And we have some pumped hydro in Europe as we have some in Japan, in China, and in, uh, in the US. And now they are building also in other countries, in, in South Africa, in Morocco, they are building pumped hydro. Uh, but we need m significantly more. And, and most people, when you talk to them about pumped hydro, they say, but, but the potential does, uh, does not exist anymore which is wrong. The potential for large hydro uh, uh, may be exhausted more or less in Europe or in, 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 in the US, but that's not the case for pumped hydro because pumped hydro requires small basins compared to what you need for large hydro. It's completely different. It's relatively small and it has to be uh, with a, in high altitude near a, a big existing uh, dam uh, with uh, traditional hydropower. And, and there is a, a study made in Europe by the Joint Research Center of the Commission that shows that the volume for storage in terawatt hours is about 10 times what we already have. Um, the Chinese are building pumped hydro stations. They will end up this year with 40 gigawatt, uh, and their target for 2020 is 70 gigawatt. It, while in Europe, we, we don't have the business model for pumped hydro. It's very weak. It, it's only based on, on the uh, 
um, um, short-term uh, marginal uh, prices on the spot market, and uh, which doesn't fit well the uh, capital-intensive nature of the technology. Uh, plus, the, the paradox is that the, the first uh, gigawatts of uh, solar erode that business model because they uh, shave the, the peak hours during uh, daytime. So the, uh, the owners of uh, pumped hydro systems are, are currently losing money and, of course, not developing the pumped hydro systems we will need in 10 or 15 years from now. Right, so the, Cédric. Uh, it's I'm important. Like... Let me finish. I'm about to finish. It's very important that the policymakers in Europe, and I'm talking to Claude, uh, uh, do something about it and create a, a status for storage uh, and, and uh, give pay all due attention to this issue. Otherwise, we will be short of storage when we need it, and then we'll have uh, lots of invasion of uh, uh, combined cycle power plants to substitute the storage that will be missing at the time. Thank right, you. Right, perfect. I would like to take a few questions. If we could get back also to the, the COP21, because this is the, uh, the, 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 the point of this debate. Short. short. Yes. Very short. My name is Yannis Tsipouridis. I come from Greece. I represent the Hellenic Wind Energy Association. The esteem panel discussed the ways that we can enter the market, be approved by the market, be welcomed by a market, but have they examined whether the market is level? And we very well know that the market is not level. There is something in this industry we'll be discussing for ages, external cost. So the internalization of external cost will make the market level and will be very easy for wind energy to develop. Fatih Birol of EIA, Madame Lagarde of IMF, they, they uh, estimate the external cost to trillions. And we're just forgetting that? Are we afraid to bring this up? If we take that into account, wind energy and other renewables are competitive and they don't need to beg to enter a market or be subjected to rules that are not met for them. And it makes a mockery of the DG.com uh, to impress these uh, changes in the support scheme for competition reasons. They first have to do it for uh, fossil fuels. Thank you. Very important so point. I think Close. this is uh, the, uh, the externalities of coal, of gas, uh, and of nuclear have never been figured in into the European electricity market. So the market is completely biased against renewables. So what, what can we do? My mantra is as long as we don't have the political courage to have true prices, then at least we need to compensate the renewables for being penalized by this biased market, which means that we need to continue with support. Uh, so that's one. And then second is, um, we, we need to get a uh, commission to deliver on what they have promised. EU Commission has done a report in December 2014 where they show that the subsidies in Europe for fossil fuel and for nuclear are higher than the subsidies for, nuclear, uh, for, for renewables. Uh, and now, basically, we will see also tomorrow in the Energy Union if Commission is finally delivering on getting this bias out of the market by a much stronger ETS. And of course, uh, one day, uh, or not one day, uh, the, the real, so what is even uh, in a certain sense more scandalous is that nuclear doesn't pay for its true costs, neither on waste, no, nor on decommissioning, nor on the risk, and that creates, of course, a bias in the market. My name is uh, Frans van der Loo. I'm from the Netherlands, uh, affiliated uh, also a member of the uh, Dutch uh, Winter Energy Association. I heard a lot about Europe uh, and uh, also quite, quite a lot about uh, Brazil, but uh, COP is uh, about uh, the whole world. And most reports indicate that the, most of the emission increase in, in the future will be from developing countries. And moreover, we have now the, the new sustainable development goals, uh, which says uh, the 20% people which have no access to energy so sh should have access in 2030. So my question is, what are you doing at the moment? What, what is your commitment or your ambition to solve that, that aspect of the, the world uh, problem? Um, and so what, what can be the role of wind power? What, what can you do in that field? That's a perfect question because I'm going to end the round table, give you all one or two sentences and you can reply to that question. That can be your conclusion. Once again, uh, if you can uh, uh, bring it down to what in, in two weeks in Paris for COP21, uh, how would you answer that question? 
Okay, so let me try. I heard an interesting fact uh, a couple of weeks ago that um, actually there are more people today without electricity than when Edison invented the uh, light bulb. And I think that tells us something about both population increases in developing markets and actually that, of course, in those markets you need more electricity and we, we have to supply that uh, electricity for the development to take place. Uh, from our point of view and from a wind point of view, I think these, uh, as we said, these are markets where the energy consumption is increasing and these are markets with very limited infrastructure today. So these are markets that actually can avoid the traps of the, the problems we have with the market dynamics in, in Europe, for example, the problem we have with the current generation here and jump straight into both a market design and a renewable mix. So I think there is actually a great opportunity for those markets to continue electrification, but actually also learn from the mistake that we have done in mature markets. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Francesco Venturini. Uh, just two things. One, uh, um, let's not forget, I mean, we, we, always for, we always remember that we are European in front of uh, tragic moments, but in reality, uh, we should remember that we are European uh, in every, every single, uh, single moment of our lives. Uh, Europe uh, has uh, nuclear power, conventional power, fantastic hydro resources, uh, solar in the south, a great wind in the north. So if we could combine all these forces instead of looking at what France, Luxembourg, uh, Belgium uh, or Italy are doing, uh, we would be probably having the cheapest uh, and uh, more a better market uh, in, uh, in the world. There is a lot of work to be done. Uh, COP21 is probably one of the many opportunities. Uh, answering to your question, uh, um, I don't believe in uh, philanthropy because, I mean, I believe in philanthropy in the short term, but not in the long term. You need to create wealth. So what we're doing is we are investing in microgrids uh, for those people who do not have access uh, um, um, to power. Um, we are doing it uh, in Latin America, we're doing it in Africa, we're doing it in Asia. Um, I think that we created a business model where we use just uh, um, uh, power from renewable sources uh, and we sell it uh, to, um, to, the local, to the locals uh, at a very convenient price. Uh, that's, that's what we're doing. Uh, another thing, uh, we pledge to be carbon free by uh, 2050 and we're really hardly working on it. Okay, right, Mar uh, Mauricio. Yes, uh, uh, I consider that we cannot uh, uh, wait that the, uh, the, uh, the renewable energy sources and the climate change uh, without only with uh, uh, govern governmental support. I think that we have to make this uh, the energy competitive, the renewable energy competitive, and make the climate change uh, solution uh, feasible. So uh, I think our role here is to try to make develop technology, what the industry uh, is doing, and to uh, develop uh, mechanisms to, to try to, uh, to uh, improve the efficiency. And I think, as I said in the beginning, that uh, market mechanism is uh, a good uh, way to do that. And uh, I think that uh, the market mechanism alone is not enough, but we cannot uh, always wait for the government support. The government support is important, but uh, if it's not economic or sustainable, uh, it's not going to prosper. Right, Cédric uh, Philibert. Sorry, Claude. Um, yeah, uh, 1.5 billion people have no access to electricity and over 2 billion people have, uh, are dependent on biomass for cooking, usually used in uh, relatively dirty and unhealthy conditions. Uh, giving access to electricity and to clean cooking fuels, even if fossil, is a priority. And it, it is important to realize that this will in no means conflict with climate change mitigation or so little at the margin with the clean cooking fuels that it's really in, in no way 
uh, you could argue that climate change should prevent uh, giving access to people to, to clean uh, cooking fuels. Uh, it's so tiny. The, the big issue with developing countries, it's not, has, has not much to do with access. It has to do with the development of industry, of transport, uh, in, the, in the cities. In, it's really different. And there there is indeed, uh, although developing countries are today investing more than uh, OECD countries in, uh, in uh, renewables, there is still a significant way to imp for improvement there because it's due to the growth of the uh, demand and, and there is also a bunch of, a uh, big number of uh, coal plants, for example, being, being built at present that are not necessarily very efficient, but even if they are efficient, they will have emissions over the next 40 years and that's way too much. And this is the real question, not access. Um, and what we wait for, what we expect from the COP, of course, is not much relative to access, but at least not contradict access, uh, but much to do uh, to uh, give uh, uh, visibility on emission trajectories which can only be translated into national policies with uh, more certainty and more um, um, uh, safety for investors in energy efficiency improvements and renewable energy deployment. Claude Thomas, the final word will be for you. Um, so, last Thursday I was in Brussels visiting a company which has developed a, a specific wind turbine for uh, remote rural areas, uh, for example in Africa. So, you don't, you, with one container you ship it down. You don't need a crane to put it up. Uh, and the maintenance is, is much easier because it's not up, but it's more and more. So this kind of dedicated um, um, maybe wind uh, infrastructure for remote areas has also a market. Um, and this device was developed by one young guy, 25 years, who had come to the idea that he wants this. Then he entered this small uh, business in Brussels and in this team they developed it. And to finish off, what, what is Paris? And Ségolène Royal has said this. Paris is an accelerator for change. And change will come not only from technology, not only from markets, not only from pro. Change will come from a societal movement. And what you are, Basically, you from the wind industry, you are climate uh, heroes in the sense that you help us. You are part of that larger community. And that's what I think should be really, in the, that should be what remains most from Paris. An accelerator and getting a huge critical mass in all countries of the world. Yes, we can win the battle against climate change. There we are. You're all climate uh, heroes. I knew you would uh, end uh, on a very positive note. Thank you very much to La Fée, well, who we can uh, give a, a round of applause to, the France Énergie Eolienne, who organized uh, this. Merci de vos applaudissements. And thank you very much indeed for a passionate debate to all our participants. And as they say in France, bon appétit. Ladies and gents, uh, my name is Tim Robinson from the European Wind Energy Association. Thank you very much, Alex, and the speakers. Just uh, uh, some uh, organizational points. The visionary debates are going on in the lunch area on the MHI Vestas offshore wind stand uh, at, uh, well, in about 10 minutes, and the business information chats happening in the media lounge uh, now on COP21 and this afternoon on state aid. So thank you very much. Bye.